Okay, David. Um, I will. I will. I will, I will kick her off for now. I'll put you on mute. Um, um, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, um, good evening, everybody, um, dear friends and colleagues. Um, it's a great honor to uh, welcome you all to this session. Um, we are at session nineteen, groundwater remediation in difficult conditions. Um, as we all know, um, groundwater contamination is a primary driver for remediation at the numerous sites. And it is also a main reason for many complex sites um, to conduct a remediation for, for decades um, and still cannot close a site. So um, I think this session is um, very informative for us to learn more about what we can do to more efficiently uh, conduct groundwater remediation under such difficult conditions. And uh, we have uh, three co-chairs for this session. Uh, and first we'll self-introduce ourselves and then uh, we will start to ask the speakers um, to, uh, to um, uh, do the talk. Um, and first I want to introduce myself. My name is Dei Yi Ho, um, I'm a associate professor at uh, Tsinghua University. Uh, which is uh, the number one university in China. Um, and we have a fast growing division in soil and groundwater remediation. And, and myself um, just came back to Tsinghua um, several years ago. And before that, I worked in the US and in the UK for more than a decade. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a great pleasure to meet you all here in this session. Um, I look forward to hear the talks um, by the presenters. Uh, next, I want to ask uh, Pietro, uh, my colleague, to introduce himself. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dei. Um, welcome to everybody. Welcome to all the speakers and the audience. Uh, I'm Piotr Wojda, working for the European Commission Joint Research Center. Uh, it's a science hub uh, providing some policy support and research um, to the uh, commission and also um, uh, working um, personally on the soil aspects. Uh, so um, I'm a um, groundwater uh, engineer uh, by uh, training, and I joined the soil team um, at uh, the JRC, um, looking at uh, pollution aspects, contaminated sites, and also um, the cycle of uh, air, water, and soil uh, pollution. And of course, the, the big initiative of the European Commission, Zero Pollution Ambition, and that we are uh, introducing. So I'm, I'm very happy to participate in this session and to um, uh, discover all the presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Piotr. Uh, David, could you introduce yourself? Uh, David, you needed to um, turn on your uh, your speaker. It's, it's on mute now. Yes, yes, okay. Can, can you see me now? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks, thanks to you. Um, my name is Dawit. I'm a senior research fellow and a principal environmental scientist at Global Center for Environmental Remediation at the University of Newcastle and CRCK. Uh, I have worked in the field for over 18 years, both in consulting and research roles uh, in environmental contaminated land management. Uh, I'm spe I specialized in the areas of fate and transports of subsurface contaminant, both as a contaminant hydrogeologist, and my uh, expertise uh, is on vapor intrusion, site uh, assessment, and risk uh, evaluations. I'm a certified environmental uh, practitioner for site contamination specialist with uh, Environmental Institute of Australia and New Zealand. Um, I look forward to listen to your all talks and learn more um, about the work you do and the new findings. And thank you so much. Thank you, David. Um, next, I will introduce our first speaker today. Um, our first speaker is uh, um, Ahab Bozit. Um, he's a, a research engineer working in Institute uh, Utina. He obtained his PhD uh, in chemistry in 2019, um, he's specialized in in situ treatment of groundwater and the soils using innovative technologies. Um, Ahab, uh, could you uh, share your screen and start your talk? Uh, 
thank you, thank you, uh, Dei. Uh, yes, go ahead, please. Hello, everyone. So today I will talk about the results uh, we got at pilot scale for the improved in situ remediation of a high velocity anisotropic aquifer using polymers. This work I'm about to show you uh, is a part of the project FAMOUS uh, that was co-founded by the French Environment and Energy Management Agency. It involves five industrial and academic partners in the domain of soil remediation. Actually, it aims at developing and assessing new technologies for the remediation of anisotropic high velocity aquifers contaminated by chlorinated compounds. So the study site is an active chemical plant. It's located above a highly anisotropic soil in which flows a high velocity and deep aquifer and water velocity is around 10 meters per day. As you can see here um, in this picture from soil samples on the site, we have an alternation of sand and gravel with no clear continuation. So on this site, uh, we have a contamination by hexachlorocyclohexanes or HCH and trichlorobenzenes or TCBs. So this contaminant is mostly absorbed, uh, absorbed since no dinapole is known. So in this case, in situ remediation is advised since the access to contaminants is hindered because of the depth. However, when using traditional fluid like water, uh, soil anisotropy and heterogeneity leads to uncontrolled ready of influence or ROI, to fingering, to preferential flows, and the heterogeneous distribution of our amendments. Thus, low permeability zones are badly swept and remain untreated. In addition, as we can see here, um, the injected solution will be leached as soon as injected and will have no resistance to the groundwater flow. So these problems led to the use of viscous but sheer thinning fluids less affected by gravity and permeability contrasts, like Zontan polymers, for example, which have persistent action by blocking and diverting the groundwater flow in the treated zone. So on this pilot scale study, uh, we studied Xantan solution, and these solutions were used to deliver sodium hydroxide for the in-situ dichlorination of HCH. The remediation process was also uh, monitored using resistivity, electrical resistivity tomography or ERT. In fact, the dechlorination of uh, HCH is basically a two-step process. So first, we have the degradation of HCH and their likely transformation to pentachlorocyclohexane, then TCBs and so on until reaching benzene. However, in this study, we will focus essentially on the first step, which includes HCS degradation. The site plan is presented here, as we can see. We have four injected injection wells screened from eight to 12 meters here shown in blue. One injection well screened deeper from 12 to 15 meters shown here in green. Three monitoring wells downstream uh, called S1, S2, and S3, and one monitoring well upstream called PZ47. For the electrical resistivity monitoring of the injection, measurements were carried out in two diagonals, as shown here by the two arrows, on I1, I5, I3, and I4, I5, I2. So we had three, uh, three wells per line, and the electrodes uh, used were stainless steel and we had eight electrodes per well from eight to 12 meters. All of this elect these electrodes were connected to uh, a strip unit which, which was connected to the receiving meter, which is the Syscall Junior Switch 48. So for the sake of the simplicity, I will only show the results obtained from the diagonal I1, I5, I3. So the alkaline polymer uh, was injected well by well, as we can see here. Uh, in each well, uh, 25 cubic meters of gel were injected before moving to the next injection well. This operation was carried out during six weeks, and in total, the final injected volume was around 148 cubic meters of alkaline gel. Considering ER3 images were taken periodically, 
first before the injection as an initial state of the medium, then during the injection into I5, the injection well I5, then three days after injection, all the injection of uh, all the, the, the 148 cubic meters, and finally three weeks after the injection to see the persistence of the injected solution. So I will start by presenting the ERT monitoring results. As you can see here, we have different images at different injected volumes of the gel. These images are the, as I mentioned before, I3, I5, I1 diagonal. So the first image here was taken before any injection. And as shown, we can see that the resistivity of the medium was high and reached almost 137 ohm meters. After injection, injecting small uh, volumes of the, our alkaline solution, the ground resistivity drastically changed as we can see here and became less resistant. So the resistivity of the medium was very low and reached almost three ohm per meters. This clearly shows that uh, the, the injected solution flowed as intended uh, and as, uh, also as a flat front, as we can see from the shape obtained from two and five cubic meters. It is important uh, to mention uh, that for these images, only five electrodes were used since we had no electrical uh, contact for the, the three electrodes which were in the unsaturated zone. However, when continuing the injection, the unsaturated zone was filled with the injected solution and the electrical contact was actually established as we can see from images from 12 cubic meters and so on. So all of these images confirm that the gel flowed in every direction and that the alkalinity uh, was maintained and that the injected solution efficiently diverted the groundwater flow since uh, the resistivity values, as you can see here, after three weeks of treatment remained very low and close to 0.5 ohm meters, which is a very low value. Here is a slide actually to show the possible presentation of these results at 3D models, which include the results of both diagonals. The 3D results uh, perf match, I mean, perfectly matched what was expected from the 2D images at the gel, as the gel actually fought in every direction in the Vados and was persistent even three weeks after the injection. These results, confirm that ERT is a relevant tool to track the injection of remedial solution into the ground. Some physical chemical parameters were also monitored in wells, such as conductivity and pH. The graph on the left here shows that conductivity values increased simultaneously in the six wells, which means that our injected gel reached the wells at the same time and flowed in every direction which also confirmed the ERT results we have obtained. Considering pH measurements in wells, high pH values reaching 11 were recorded uh, over the five wells heights after the first, just the first 25 cubic meters. Only I6 was alkaline after the injection on its screen depth, which is deeper than the other uh, five wells. We also noted that the pH remained high several weeks after the end of the injection, which means that the gel was not leached by the fast groundwater flow, which was likely diverted. Groundwater quality uh, was carried out by monitoring HCH degradation downstream in S1, S2, S3, and upstream in PZ47. And here are the results of HCS analysis in groundwater before, during, and after the injection, upstream and downstream. So for example, in upstream in the PZ47 well, HCS degradation reached almost 80%. And the slight increase we see here during injection phase is likely due to the mobil mobilization of HCS from downstream. 
for downstream monitoring wells, S1, S2, and S3, we observed that for S1, we had a probably, or we had a leaching without degradation, which explains the low degradation rate of 17.5%. But for S2 and S3, HCH was strongly de degraded at degradation rate almost reached 98% for S2. Then the soil was drilled for analysis one month after the injection. The drilling position are presented here by the black points. And they were situated between each injected uh, injection well and was carried out over uh, the whole depth from surface to 15 meters below ground level. And here are the results of HCS analysis in soil cores before and after treatment for the two heights. So the results show that for both heights from zero to 15 or from eight to 12 meters, which represents the screened, uh, the screened height for the gel injection, the results show that HCS degradation was very high and reached almost 84% for the eight to 12 meter section, which confirms once again that our solution actually flowed in every direction and was persistent. Also, a very important, it's noteworthy that HCS degradation will be even more lowered since the reaction is likely still in progress, which will be confirmed by a last ERT image will be carried out soon. Um, then chlorobenzenes and benzenes, which can be a, a byproduct of HCS degradation, were also monitored before and after treatment. And actually for all of them, we had no significant variation. For TCB, for example, which is a possible by, by a direct byproduct of HCB degradation, no significant changes were observed. However, it is noteworthy that if, if we consider that 100% of the HCS was converted to trichlorobenzenes, you will only have a very low TCB concentration generated of about 90 to 110 milligrams per kilo, which is very low considering the initial TCB concentration measured on site. So as for conclusion, we showed that our alkaline gel had a good injectability, which decreased with filling of the soil. We also showed that ERT is a relevant tool for enter well vision during injection and monitoring. ERT and conductivity results showed that the gel propagated in every direction, including upstream, with only small scale fingering, which was reduced with the injection. The gel and the alkaline condition were also persistent over three weeks after the last injection, as was shown by ERT results. We also had excellent reduction of HCS concentrations in water and soil after a month at uh, targeted depth and beyond. And as I said before, those concentrations are likely to be more lowered since the reaction is still in progress. And considering other byproducts, we had no significant change for TCBs, uh, CBs, chlorobenzenes, as well as for dioxins. Finally, I would like to thank Solvay and Adem for financing this project and thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, I hope. Um, this is a great presentation. And um, for all the um, participants, um, I, I'd like to encourage you to uh, raise questions and put it in the chat box. And we will collect the questions for the speakers during our panel discussion at the end of the session. Uh, next, I will introduce our second speaker, um, Craig Cox. Uh, Mr. Craig Cox is a geologist and he serves as a president and a principal scientist for Cox Coven Associates. Uh, he is responsible for providing managerial and technical oversight on major environmental projects conducted by the firm. Now, um, let's welcome Craig, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my talk today is about uh, two sites in, in Ohio that had uh, the same VOC or suite of VOCs, but very different outcomes when it came to groundwater uh, cleanup. So let's take a look at the two sites. Uh, they're both in, uh, in Ohio, which is in the Midwest 
western portion of the United States. Uh, site one in the mid 1990s, uh, monitoring at a municipal well field detected low concentrations of uh, chlorinated VOCs in their raw water samples. In Ohio, EPA then went out and conducted a limited groundwater investigation to find uh, potentially responsible parties. And by 1998, three PRPs uh, were identified and asked to conduct a uh, regional groundwater assessment and remediation. At site two, uh, in 1994, US EPA and Ohio EPA conducted, conducted assessments based on a response to uh, citizens' complaints about groundwater contamination. Following the assessment, uh, Cox Colvin began assessing soil groundwater and soil vapor concentrations at the site. And the assessment activities led to remediation of the sources and on-site containment of contaminated groundwater. So we had to contain groundwater before it went off-site early on in the process. So let's look at the conceptual site models for these two sites. Um, site one, the geologic setting is a, uh, so it's a sole source aquifer contained within a glacial outwash. It's about five to 60 plus meters in thickness and, and about three and a half kilometers wide. It's extremely prolific aquifer with flow rates of approximately three meters per day has a high oxygen content, low fraction organic carbon. So, that, so it kind of limited what we could do from uh, biological um, enhancement. Uh, this is what the conditions look like in 1998 uh, after the initial studies done by Ohio EPA, there was 51 groundwater sampling points. Uh, by 2005, there was 473 uh, sampling points. This was a combination of wells, domestic wells, monitor wells, production wells, and a lot of geoprobe uh, temporary tr uh, transects. When we evaluated all the data based on that information and looked at it as ratio plots, we found that there were six separate groundwater plumes. Um, they all had a little bit uh, different concentration. If you look in the middle, the blue uh, dots represent a plume that's mainly PCE, so you can get your eye trained to what, that, uh, what those dots look like. So for the conceptual site model, uh, the geologic setting was, again, it was a thick uh, glacial till sitting on, on bedrock. And there was an upper till, upper sand layer. The middle sand layer is the one that everyone used for uh, domestic wells and for production wells within the region. So that's the one that was contaminated and, and the one that we uh, studied the most. There was a middle till. And then eventually there was a lower till or a lower sand that was uh, hardly used. So here's the upper sand in cross section. This is the middle sand, the lower sand, and the water tables represent in red. Uh, the contaminant suites were PCE, TCE, and TCA. Um, the release mechanisms, when we looked at one location and did a soil gas survey, we found that there was a high concentration of, uh, of VOCs in the southern part of this building. When we looked at it, tetrachloroethylene uh, matched very well with our PID readings. Uh, there was some TCE. And when we did a, a soil uh, mat or a soil campaign to uh, collect uh, soil samples from at depth, what we found was that the releases occurred in the 1950s. So there was basically a large TCE release uh, that was probably just going outside and dumping uh, used solvents on the ground, which was common practice back then. For fate and transport, in the Vado zone, the residence time is measured in the order of decades. So this happened in 1950, and in two, 2020, it is still a very strong source. So it, it, you know, it's, it could be a century uh, later that these contaminants will still be in the Vado zone. In the saturated zone, um, the residence time, though, however, is measured in years because uh, once it, it eventually leaches out in, in very slow progression to the aquifer, um, then it, it travels very quickly at, at, on the order of 10 meters a day. Um, these are dissolved concentrations in an aer aerobic uh, situations. So the second site is a uh, Pennsylvanian sandstone, which is much different. 
So it's a, also a primary source of drinking water, 20 plus meters of sandstone bedrock with glacial overburden. But the groundwater flow rate in this set, in this situation is very limited. It's, you know, a tenth or, or less than what the flow rate is at the, at the other site. So here's what our groundwater situation looked like from 2005. We had widespread contamination at the site, which required us to put in a containment system, pump and treat system early on so that we could keep contaminants from moving offsite. Uh, eventually seven source areas were identified. And so let's look at how that looks on our geologic setting in this one. So what we can see is we do have, you know, this rain of contamination coming through the, the, uh, lacustre, or the glacial and lacustrian till that's above the bedrock. Once it reaches bedrock, which is very shallow, it runs down through fractures in the porous bedrock and then is migrates off site. Its contaminant uh, suite is very similar to the first site, PCE, TCE, and CIS-12 DCE. The release mechanisms were through the back doors and storage areas where they use solvents and the sanitary and uh, floor drains uh, were in bad repair. And they also had a septic system. So a lot of the, the releases were actually from the processes in the building, washing off the, uh, the contaminants into a septic system, which was basically a direct injection into the bedrock. For fate and transport in the Vado zone, again, we have this residence time on the order of decades uh, with denapple concentrations in an aerobic environment. And for the saturated zone, the residence time is again in decades because the, the groundwater flow rate is so slow. Um, and it's saturated conditions because again, it, the denapple was able to, to be transported directly into the saturated zone very quickly. So here's, a, uh, we'll discuss the remedial actions that were taken and the outcomes. At site one, we had three sites that stretched uh, quite a long distance from one another that were evaluated and, and remediated. The first one was basically a TCE, TCA source, about 85 cubic, 8,500 cubic meters of material. They used ASSVE and in situ thermal desorption at a cost of about two to $4 million. At the second site, there was again about 8,000 cubic meters of source area that was remediated. This again was ASSVE, some excavation in areas that were easily excavated, uh, followed by potassium permanganate injections and easy VI in one situation. And that cost was about one and a half to $2 million. And the third site was about 2,600 cubic meters in a single source. Uh, because it was easy to get to, uh, we just simply excavated and removed all the source material we could and then injected a little bit of, uh, is, of, of uh, oxidant just to kind of do a polishing step. And that was about $0.7 million. So let's see how this went. Uh, plume one is the, is the one that we talked about first. It was mostly TCA. In this situation, um, the red dots are the highly contaminated areas and it decreases down to a green dot, which, is a, you know, which means that you've done a pretty good job. Uh, you can see in two, 2002, before uh, remediation began, uh, what the situation looked like. And by 2016, see most of the contamination from thermal absorption uh, techniques that were used there has been destroyed. And so there's very little left within the plume and then we're in very good shape. Uh, the two red dots in plume four are associated with a site that hasn't even begun their remediation yet. For the, uh, another plume, the one that we worked on mostly, uh, this is the PCE plume. This is what the conditions look like in 2002. Again, the red dots are bad and the green dots are good. Um, by 2016, you can see that we've done a pretty good job of reducing concentrations, but some of them still remain above our, our uh, goal uh, for treatment. Uh, I think part of this is due to the fact that the retardation factor for PCE is about twice that of TCA, and so some of it tends to linger a little bit longer. We have some more recent data. We're, we're doing monitored natural attenuation on that 
uh, site now. And uh, most of that plume is now gone by 2021. So if we look at the other site where we have containment uh, going on, this is what the situation looks like now. Uh, containment, pump and treat. We've, can, we've pumped and treated about 1 billion liters of water and only removed about 300 kilograms of TCE. Um, excavations, we went inside the building and outside the building. See, here's, the, here's an inside the former laboratory that they had at the site. And we were able to dig down to the top of bedrock. You can see how close bedrock is in this situation. And then we put in these little galleries to inject uh, ISCO later. That excavation removed about 3,800 tons, of, metric tons of material. And then soil vapor extraction of the bedrock zone, uh, the Beto portion of the bedrock zone, uh, worked for about three years and removed about 1,400 kilograms. Eventually, we just were not getting the returns anymore that we, we had hoped for. So that's, that's why it only went for three years. That was about $3 million in total. So in 2007, this is what the, the situation looked like. Again, the same sort of, of idea of red is bad and green is good. And you see that the contamination across the site is, is really uh, exceeds five times our, our goal. And by 2020, you can see very little has happened. Uh, you know, there's some down gradient edges gotten a little bit better, but for the most part, the contamination in the bedrock is still um, very high. So the lessons that we learned from all this, uh, first is the release mechanisms for the two sites were very different. One was to the till and, and the second one was direct to bedrock. Uh, in the Vado stone portion, the fine grain till that was denapple and that was, took decades to, to move through that. But the nice part about it was it tend to bind up the, uh, the concentrate or to bind up the denapple so it didn't just directly go into the, into the aquifer. On the other situation, we had more porous sandstone with dean apple concentrations. Again, it's still st sticking around for decades, but it but moves through very quickly and gets into the, to the saturated zone. In the saturated zone of site one, we had a high uh, K outwash and dissolved concentrations. And so again, it only takes years for that, for the contaminants to move through the system from the source to the eventually where they dissipate. On site two, however, there's low K sandstone, saturated concentrations for groundwater, for uh, in the groundwater. And it, again, it's gonna take decades to clean up. Groundwater flow rates, again, you can see how, how different they are, three meters per day versus 0.3 meters per day. And the source area elimination, we were very successful at, the, at site one to remove sources and in site two, we weren't. And I think that's the key is if we can't remove the sources, We'll be struggling with cleaning up uh, groundwater, especially in fractured bedrock, for quite some time. And I appreciate your attendance, and I'll be around for any questions that you may have later. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, this uh, are very interesting case studies and very good uh, lessons learned. Next, I'd like to ask my colleague David to uh, introduce the next uh, three speakers. Uh, David, uh, you needed to put your speaker on. Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, yes. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, great speakers so far, you know, good, good practical case studies um, in real-time real project um, demonstrations. Um, the next speaker is Christoph Perner. Um, Christoph Perner is an environmental hydrogeologist working as a project manager and technical advisor for Golders in France uh, for the last 10 years. He works on a projects of characterization and remediation. He's also lead laboratory of feasibility test located in Lyon. His presentation is on feasibility tests of remediation of an hexavalent chromium contamination by contamin uh, chemical reduction. Over to you, Chris. Yeah, thank you. You can see my screen? Yes. Yes, okay, I will stop my video just to say uh, hello to everybody. I stopped my video to, okay. uh, to share my screen. 
and share my PowerPoint. Okay, so this presentation, so thank you. And uh, this presentation will focus on a laboratory test we have performed uh, in Golde, uh, in uh, Lyon, our office. I'm from Office of Lyon. And this uh, laboratory test were uh, performed to uh, evaluate the feasibility of uh, chromium reduction uh, plume. So first I will uh, present the site. So we are working on a site located in Normandy in Northwest of France. And on this site, uh, there is a workshop uh, in which uh, occurred uh, 30 years ago, an accidental spill of uh, one ton of chromium salt. So hexavalent chromium. And so it induced, so the spill uh, an hexavalent chromium plume going from uh, the plant to downstream near the Seine, so the river next to the plant. So the two main characteristics of this site are that first, uh, the water table is deep, it's 30 meter depth. And second main characteristic is that uh, the plant is built uh, onto a shark. So it's the main geology in Normandy and the north of France. And so this shark is very particular because it's characterized by a double porosity so a first um, micro porosity into the matrix, so intergranular inter porosity, and the second one, which is a macro porosity into the fracture. And it's very important because this double porosity really control the behavior and the transfer of the pollutant uh, from the source to the, the water table and to downstream in direction of the river. We can see we have just uh, next to the workshop, very high concentration of chromium, uh, 250 milligram per liters, and we have still four milligram per liters downstream, just next to the river. And so our work uh, on this site uh, is to find and to compare the different remedi remediation options to find the best one to be able to remediate this site. So the main question uh, or the, 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 this one. First, uh, we were wondering um, if uh, on this site is more adapted the chemical reduction of the chromium or the biological reduction of the chromium. And the second one, the second question is that um, do we have uh, to treat directly the source or it's a is it the best idea to uh, treat uh, downstream by the uh, implementation of a reactive barrier. So to answer to this question, uh, we have uh, performed laboratory tests which are part of a global strategy. So we uh, have begun two years ago to, of course, uh, to perform a precise diagnostic of the site, to really understand the size of the plume, the depth of the plume, the different uh, hydrodynamics uh, characteristic of the aquifer, so the velocity of groundwater, the porosity, the permeability. And uh, with all this information, we have been able to design the laboratory, laboratory test. And after that, we will perform uh, at the beginning of next year in situ a pilot test to be able to write and to propose a management plan for the administration, proposing the best solution and the best technology to manage these sites. And the strategy was in the laboratory test to compare and to use two different device, two different protocol. So the first one, which are uh, the batch test, and the second one, which are the lysimeter test. And we, uh, it, it's, it's the objective of this presentation to, um, to explain and to show that both uh, device are important uh, to use and the information got by these two device. Uh, are important to be able to um, to conclude on the feasibility of the the, the rehabilitation. And the second one uh, is a strategy was to test several reductive reagents. So the one uh, used for the chemical reduction of chromium, so the chemical reduction from chromium six to chromium three, which is a less toxic and less mobile uh, form of the chromium. And so the different uh, chemical uh, region uh, tested were sodium dithionate, so calcium polysulfide, and the, the rovalene iron. And we also have tested some uh, region um, inducing the uh, biological reduction of chromium. And so uh, we have used a, a carbon source to reduce water and chromium. 
On this slide, I just want to precise and to talk about the different advantages of disadvantages of each device. So the batch, which is a very known and used uh, protocol, the batch test, uh, they are very used because these, these are uh, small devices in which we put uh, soil and water with a ratio of 1 per 10. So it's a small and rapid protocol allowing to test many modalities so we can run multiple trials in parallel. But the main disadvantages of this uh, protocol is that when you mix and you steer soil and water, you create a, a sludge. And so you work on disaggregated soils, uh, which are totally non-representative of the truck double porosity. So we really know that this protocol um, induced a, a, an overestimation of all process of desorption, solubilization of compounds. So we also have used the lysimeter, which is a big column uh, in, in glass, uh, says, uh, says <laughs> 16 liters uh, column, which is filled, uh, I can remove that, sorry, which is filled uh, with intact shock cores. So we keep the double porosity of the matrix. Uh, and so we, it, it is uh, this test representative of the double porosity of the material. And in this column, we inject the reagent or water to wash the column with a flow rate, which is really representative of the flow rate uh, occurring into the aquifer. So these are the main advantages, but there is a main uh, disadvantage too, is that uh, it's a long uh, test, uh, difficult to prepare and to operate, so uh, we cannot test many, many modalities with that kind of device. So the best solution is to begin uh, to test many modalities, many region, many dosage with the batch. And after that, to confirm the result with more representative test, which is a lysimeter one. So uh, more precise about the batch protocol, um, the batch were filled with uh, uh, first soil. So soil which were sampled uh, on site at 10 meter depth in the impacted zone. And so the soil used were uh, impacted with 2,700 milligram per kilogram of chromium, which are mainly some of course, uh, chromium exavalent. And different dosage, of each uh, reductor, so a region, were used. Um, and the tests were operated, uh, performed during 40 days uh, duration with six intermediate, intermediate sampling of aqueous phase to analyze the residual uh, chromium six and chromium three. Um, so, uh, all the results we got uh, have been compared to a blank, so to a standard a badge in which we have not inserted uh, any regent. And uh, the result of the standard are presented there. And so we can see that just after one day of mixing with the of soil and water, we got in aqueous phase a uh, concentration of a tree. 100 milligram per liters of chromium 6 and 50 milligram per liters of chromium 3. So high concentration of chromium into the aqueous phase. So uh, representative of desorption of chromium. So we can compare uh, this result with the residual uh, concentration we got with different uh, regions. And we first can observe that the residual concentration in aqueous phase were very, very low with sodium dithionate and calcium polysulfide. So uh, residual concentration of chromium-6 uh, comprised between 20, 100 microgram per liters and concentration of chromium-3 uh, between 400 and 800 microgram per liters. So very high abatement of residual concentration in water. But uh, the results were not as good as this one for uh, the Rovaland iron and for carbon, uh, for example, with carbon source. Uh, after 40 days of mixing of, uh, uh, of water and soil and carbon, we have not observed any decrease of uh, chromium-6 concentration into the aqueous phase. So at this stage, at the end of the batch test, we have concluded that the chemical reduction uh, is the 
most efficient to treat and to uh, reduce uh, chromium-6, but we can just wonder about uh, the issue of residual um, chromium-3, which is not so low. So we can wonder if there is a colloidal form of uh, chromium-3, which, uh, which uh, could have been sampled with aqueous phase. And we have concluded that we, in this geology, biological reduction has been inefficient, maybe because we have sampled soil so uh, very deep, because the contamination is very deep, and because maybe because uh, the microbial biomass into the soil very deep is not developed enough. So we, uh, with this conclusion, we wanted to confirm the result with the lysimeter uh, test. So the lysimeter protocol, um, is this one. So we use the same soil, but we keep intact cores of uh, shock impacted by the same level of contamination and directly inserted into the lysimeter. I will present the result uh, got with sodium dichonate because it is one in which uh, with which the result was the best in the batch test. And we have operated it by injecting the dichonate, uh, sodium dichonate into uh, the, the column. And by washing after that uh, the column with 10 per volume and with a flow rate of one per volume per day, which is representative of the velocity of uh, groundwater measured on sites. And the leakates were uh, successively um, sampled at the output of the column. Just to note that we also have made a tracing of this column to understand the hydrodynamics and to understand that the regent uh, crossed, of course, the column and um, reached a maximum of concentration at the output of the column uh, after 0 0.8 per volume. This graph presents a concentration of chromium at the output of the column after the first washing without any reagent. So we can observe that, of course, at the beginning of the washing, we got very high concentration of chromium, uh, chromium-6, very low concentration of chromium-3. This concentration decreased very quick. And after five power volumes of washing, we got an equilibrium and we got a concentration of 80 milligram per liters of chromium-6. Uh, this concentration is lower than the one observed at the equilibrium equilibrium in the batch, but you remember that we said that the batch uh, overestimates the solub solubilization of chromium. So this concentration at equilibrium is um, closer than the, the, the reality. So the most important result are there. So first, we have uh, injected into the column uh, sodium dithionates and washed it during a uh, five per volume of water. And we can observe that after the injection of the region, we got a concentration of <laughs> chromium-6, <laughs> which is near zero microgram per liters. And we get, it's difficult to see because of the scale, but we have a residual concentration of chromium-3, which is uh, the same as in the batch test, it's interesting, of 700 microgram per liters of chromium tree. So we confirm this issue with chromium tree. So that's why we have tested to add with sodium dichonate another uh, compound, which is sulf uh, iron sulfates. And um, it's uh, interesting to observe that when we uh, inject both sodium dichonate and iron sulfate, we got at equilibrium, so during five per volume of washing after the injection of the region, a concentration of chromium-6 of zero and the concentration of chromium-3, which is two very low two microgram per liters. So it's important to uh, note that to reach uh, to the, the good feasibility and efficiency of this kind of test, we have to add iron sulfate to precipitate and uh, immobilize chromium tree into the porosity of the soil and to prevent on transports with groundwater. Last result is that we is that one 
we were rendering, rendering sorry, at this stage, what is risk of uh, ribbon defects by retrodiffusion of the chromium, for example, from the anthroporosity of the shock to the microporosity. And that's why we have performed and run a very long term um, uh, washing of the column, which was treated, remediate, during uh, 80 power volumes, so during 80 days of washing. And so we can see, of course, there is a low increase of chromium concentration at, at the output. That means that there is a retro diffusion from the entroporosity to the microporosity of this chromium, but this rebound effect is acceptable and very limited because it's uh, we have only after 80 power volumes only 20 microgram per liters of chrome entry and less than 100 microgram per liters of chrome uh, six and we are directly in the source so we can say it's acceptable so we can conclude that um, the batch test of course are very useful to test many regions many of those age, but it's very interesting to add a second device, which are the lysimeter test, because they allow the, the understanding of real process, including, for example, the effect of colloidal transport in a flow rep representative of in-situ flow. We have shown that sodium detonate is adapted to this site, this particular site, to remediate the chromium plume. Uh, the chromium source and chromium plume, of course, and we observe that we have to add some iron sulfate to uh, precipitate chromium tree. And mainly we have observed that the rebound effect is uh, acceptable. So we can go through now pilot tests to confirm uh, all we have observed in the laboratory to propose to administration the treatment of the site with sodium detonates. I thank you and I will be uh, happy to answer too. To your questions. Thank you, Christophe. And uh, we will put all the questions together for the panel discussion. And um, I encourage all the participants to drop your question as the presentation goes in the chat box. Um, so um, the next presenter would be Mar Marta. Uh, she's a postdoctoral research in the Department of Chemistry at uh, Stefano so University of Rome, Italy. She's working principally on alternative and more sustainable approach to promote the anaerobic reductive dechlorination using low cost and bio-based material from a renewable resource. She's uh, industrial chemistry by trade and she did her PhD in chemical engineering and uh, her current postdoctoral work focuses on biochar applications and combined with biological remediation technology. Over to you, Marta. Yeah, thank you. Hello everybody. So I'm going to show you this biological uh, reactor realized with the polyhydroxybutyrate and biochar as a possible combination of uh, the two mechanisms, the absorption and biodegradation to remove the chloroethylene. So here are summarized the, the main characteristics of a contamination scenario by uh, chlorinated solvents. So uh, the problems are uh, used, uh, often linked to the accumulation and the formation of the slow uh, secondary uh, sources of uh, contamination. And um, uh, especially because we have to face uh, with the phenomenon of aging and back diffusion and the formation of long distance uh, plumes uh, of contamination. So uh, actually today we can choose uh, uh, through a lot of uh, technologies uh, for the managing uh, both of, of uh, the primary and the secondary source of uh, contamination. But uh, uh, my group uh, is focusing on uh, more sustainable options included in uh, the uh, in situ biological strategies. Uh, uh, specifically, the uh, in situ enhanced bioremediation is a well-known diffused uh, technology chosen when the site condition is uh, favorable. We are particularly interested uh, in the re anaerobic reductive uh, dechlorination, which is a step-by-step -step, uh, reaction, um, mediated primarily by the allococoides, 
thanks to a substrate that supplies the electric donor. Today, we are able to identify the uh, microorganism and the functional genes which are essential to perform the complete transformation of uh, perfluoroethylene to the non-toxic ethylene. To deal with uh, some uh, limitation of the only biological strategy, uh, and also to reduce the diffusion of the plume of contamination, the addition of uh, a physical chemical uh, approach combined uh, to the biostimulation could be a good choice. Uh, our team have worked on a contaminated sites in Italy where the adsorption and biodegradation were combined to further meet uh, the, remedi the remediation uh, objective. Um, since uh, this approach uh, has uh, inspired us, uh, we have changed the materials to make the process uh, more sustainable and for uh, shedding light on alternative and biomaterials. So I have used uh, Bioshark and uh, as uh, an absorbent and as uh, a biofilm support. And uh, as an electron donor, um, we have used the polyhydroxy butyrate because uh, it is synthesized by microorganism and it could be fermented again back to uh, short chain fatty acid. Uh, while Bioshar, uh, I know that uh, uh, during last day, someone has uh, spoke about uh, this material. So uh, Bioshar has gained our attention and the interest of the scientific community because it is a bioproduct for the thermal treatment of agricultural waste. It's a well-known solar maintenance and many research groups are deeply studying this material uh, because it can uh, immobilize contaminants participate uh, with uh, the electron transfer uh, and uh, um, nutrient uh, exchange uh, in the subsoil. So the experimental activity was divided uh, in three phases. First, we have chosen the first, the better, um, the bachelor with the uh, higher absorption capacity. And uh, we have used it uh, in a lab scale uh, uh, column with uh, an enriched uh, dialococoides uh, culture. Uh, and uh, finally, we have uh, realized a um, mini pilot scale uh, reactor. Uh, it was uh, uh, about uh, 10 liters uh, of uh, geometric volume with two reactive areas. Uh, the first one uh, with uh, polygrass butyrate and the second one with Bashar and the uh, dialococoides uh, biofilm. So here uh, you can find some information of the Baisha we have used. This was produced from pine wood waste, uh, uh, gasified at high temperature. Um, the morphological characterization and the absorption test, both uh, in batch and column, um, resulted in some useful parameters uh, to um, related to the absorption capacity. We have used uh, trichloroethylene as the contaminant target. And the results were published in comparison with other uh, two Baisha and one activated carbon. I will go directly to the uh, PHB Baisha uh, reactor. So uh, some details on how we have prepared this uh, reactor. The soil was first heated wet uh, and the fermentation zone was prepared by using both uh, powder and pellets of uh, uh, polyhydroxybutyrate to test the long lasting effects of these uh, two different forms. And uh, before the biomass, uh, the biomass addition, a uh, tracer test was performed, and then one liter of uh, ionophilum was injected uh, uh, through the lateral sampling gates. Uh, the feeding solution was um, uh, tap water contaminated with uh, trichloroethylene at about 100 micromolar concentrated and pumped up. Uh, these are the conditions, working conditions. Uh, for the first uh, six months, uh, uh, was uh, the test started on September 2020, and these are the results till the February. And I would like to draw attention on the challenging conditions that we uh, applied uh, as the flow rate, uh, the low residential time, the high TC load uh, expressed as uh, milligrams per day, and high flow water velocity. Uh, the reductive uh, dechlorination reaction and the fermentation of the biopolymer was uh, monitored by daily and weekly sampling of the liquid phase. And uh, also uh, a volume was uh, also sampled for the microbial analysis. Um, 
as you can see, uh, the results, the monitoring of the chlorinated compounds uh, uh, during the first week, so during the startup phase, uh, um, showed that the absorption was uh, the dominant uh, mechanism since the trichloroethylene disappears only from the gate number eight, uh, uh, where the bishamp started. Um, we immediately noticed that uh, uh, polyhydroxybutyrate fermentation had begun since acetylphenicetate were detected in the sample. After one month of operation, uh, we can see that uh, already in the first zone, the trichloroethylene is complete, was completely uh, converted in the cheese uh, dichloroethylene, but uh, uh, the intermediates uh, were um, absorbed also in the Balshar uh, zone, ensuring uh, um, effluent with uh, chlorinated compounds under the detection limits. To make a kinetic uh, interpretation of the data, we can report the concentration of the compounds against the time in the reactor. So here you can see some PPI uh, at different days of operation and improvement in overall kinetics uh, in terms of uh, trichloroethylene removal can be observed. Uh, this is surely caused by the acclimatization of the biofilm and also uh, by a general increase of the biomass in the reactor itself. But uh, uh, it is interesting to notice that uh, each zone, each reactive area uh, was able to complete uh, the first step and then the second step of the uh, biological reductive dechlorination. And uh, at the end of the reactor, we have the complete conversion in vinyl chloride with tracer of ethylene. Uh, I would like to uh, say that uh, ethylene was revealed, but we cannot quantify it due to analytical limitation because we have uh, we analyzed only the liquid phase. Um, here are reported the results of uh, the VFA production monitoring. So you can see some um, some period. Uh, we observe uh, um, a peak in the first period, uh, certainly due to the uh, rapid fermentation of the powder. On the other hand, uh, the pellets required more time to detach from the microorganism, and this is uh, uh, due to the higher crystallinity of the pellet form and uh, um, reduces surface area. So in this period where you can see um, lack of electron donor supply, we uh, actually um, feed uh, the reactor uh, for three weeks with lactate, uh, and during the Christmas break, we uh, stop the feeding, and uh, this allows to, um, the, to start the fermentation also of the pellets. So from January, we have observed uh, the um, fermentation has begun since VFAs were detected constantly. And uh, I would like to uh, say that after these are results uh, till February, but this reactor has worked continuously till June without uh, um, any other PhD addition. So this is another way to see the results. Uh, this is the influent versus uh, the effluent uh, as uh, mm, with this, uh, the increasing of the working days of operation. Uh, so clearly no breakthrough point uh, for TC was observed and the removal of trichloroethylene was quantitative for all this investigative period. And in addition, for the first 50 days, uh, no chlorinated uh, compounds were uh, detected in the effluent uh, because by sharp low down product release uh, due to the absorption effects. Uh, I would like to point out to this concept, uh, these uh, problems uh, linked to the ethylene uh, quantification, but corresponding to this uh, decrease of the chloride, uh, maybe uh, the biofilm was able in the last zone of the reactor to convert uh, and to produce also uh, ethylene. So the combination of these uh, two approach, the absorption and biodegradation, uh, made it possible to, redu to remove uh, 16 kilograms of trichlor ethylene without the saturation of the absorbing the material. These are the next uh, generation sequential analysis of uh, different samples 
comparison between the inoculum we have injected and the sample at PHB zone collected at uh, PHB zone, Bioshark zone, and in the outlet. So we can see that despite the difficult conditions of working, the, uh, the allococoides uh, enrich the Bioshark zone. We are waiting for the results uh, of more detailed analysis, uh, such as metagenomic analysis uh, and quantitative PCR from the colleagues of uh, IRSA. Um, the study, in conclusion, sheds light on a concrete and useful use of Bishar to support such a specific biosim uh, composed uh, by the allococoides, uh, even in condition of high TCA load and high feed rate. Uh, it is important to find uh, a better configuration of strategy to avoid the wind chloride accumulation, for sure, and by, uh, for example, by increasing the residence time or the reactive zone uh, length. Uh, so um, it is possible to uh, create uh, um, or adding by simply by adding more uh, quantities of bishar. To comply with the principle of the circular economy, uh, one idea is also to replace the commercial PHP with polyhydroxy alkanase from mixed uh, microbial culture by using organic residues. Uh, and um, this is a possible um, schematized proposal of a possible application. So if you're interested, uh, I advise you to read some papers about uh, this uh, uh, polyhydroxy uh, alkanoate uh, produced by uh, mixed microbial culture because uh, um, they are very interesting and innovative materials that we can use, uh, for example, by adding a biomass rich uh, of these uh, biopolymers directly in the subsoil to prompt the indigenous uh, activity uh, thanks to a slow release of uh, electron donor. So, I thank you for the attention. This is my email address for any questions. Thank you, Martha. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, still, we, I encourage all the participants to drop the question in the chat box and uh, Martha will thank be you. with us in the panel discussion for, um, to answer your question. The next presentation is by Sophia and uh, Sophia is environmental engineer and a PhD candidate at Poitiers University in France. She developed her thesis on characterization of a mass pollutant in fractured aquifer, where she is investigating characterization protocols and developed new techniques in the lab scale models. Her talk is on denapple of chlorinated compound in fractured media, mass transfer and mass assessment. Please join me to welcome Sophia. Hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me well? Yes, we do. Okay, as I said, uh, I'm Sofia Visitación Carrillo. I'm PhD candidate of Poitiers University in France. Yes. And I will present you my latest results in, uh, in the Naples of fluorinated compounds in Factor Media. Can I make your screen in full? Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Um, we start with uh, Naples are non aqueous phase liquids, meaning that they don't mix with water, they are hydrophobic. Petroleum products such as gasoline and diesel, as well as chlorinated comb solvents, are some examples. Uh, this latter, the chlorinated compounds, are generally denser than water, so they belong to the group of the Naples. In the event of the lake of this Naples, the quality of the groundwater is is immediately threatened. They will sink into the bottom of the aquifer and dissolve permanently, resulting in a long thermal source zone and a plume of dissolved contaminants impacting directly on water supply and ecosystems. This problem becomes worse when it occurs in fracture media with a high permeability and isotropy, preferential flow paths, and lack of accessibility. accessibility. Uh, the polluted zone can be anywhere, and this is a, a very disturbing problem for remediation in this zone. Furthermore, it is known that the mass of the pollutant in the contaminated area increases the concentration and extent of the pollution plume. As a result, remediation effort 
primarily aim on the removal of the pollutant in ma mass in the, zones, in the source zone to prevent further environmental damage. Uh, the strategy is then to remove this mass of pollutants, meaning that the dimensioning of the remediation and monitoring of the procedure relates on well, uh, in the well mass characterization of the polluted zone. This is why what I am working on nowadays, characterization. Uh, among the SCARS characterization tools, we can find the PIT technique, partitioning interval tracer test. Uh, which can evaluate large volumes of contaminated material as well as the mass uh, and average saturation of the navel. It's an integrative technique that dates back uh, to the 90s and has been totally evaluated in a malovial environment. It implies injecting a conservative tracer as well as numerous, uh, numerous partitioning tracers at the same time. The differential in the affinity of these tracers, the, the partition coefficient, it will then result in a chromatographic separation within the contaminated zone here. Uh, tracers with higher affinity for the maple in red um, will have will show a more delayed signal to respect with respect to those with non-affinity in blue. But knowing the volume swept, uh, we calculate the saturation and, uh, of the contaminant phase in the environment and therefore the mass of the pollutant using mathematical analysis of this delay. Uh, the pit, uh, this technique is typically performed with a variety of alcohols with different partition coefficients. Uh, nevertheless, uh, large volumes of products are injected resulting in very high expenses. Um, the alcohols that we use is hexanol, isopropanol. Uh, they need uh, gas chromatography analysis, which might add, might add to the implementation cost. As a result, in this study, we propose the, just, the, the use of fluorophores, fluorescent dyes, which allow us to do cheaper analysis and um, are very simple to apply and also environmental friendly. In order to confirm the reliability of the fluorescent dyes as partitioning tracers uh, of one selected maple, we have analyzed their partition coefficients. Um, the fluorescent dye is added to a vice basic uh, system, as we see in the picture, where um, uh, water and maple are included. Uh, the navel in this study is a navel pumped from a polluted side. It's very black and it's very old, <laughs> and uh, it's very particular to this species. Uh, then the ratio of the fluorescent dye concentration in both phases is analyzed by this graphic. And uh, 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 it's analyzed by the uh, UV visible spectrometry. According to previous studies, like we see here, partition coefficient must empirically prove a linear relationship uh, which indicates independency of concentration. Um, given the five fluorescent dyes that we, do, that we studied, eosine, rhodamine B, fluorescine, sulfur rhodamine, rhodamine WBP, uh, all the outcomes uh, in our analysis uh, exhibited a satisfactory linear regression fit confirming a good agreement with this statement. All of them meaning are potential partitioning tracers. Hence, from the literature, uh, um, Rodamine WUT is the most suited candidate as a partitioning tracer for, a, for an optimal performance of a, pit, of a pit because it's on the range values that have already successfully worked in pit emissions like uh, the range varies, varies from 10 to uh, some decimal. To test our characterization method and due to their benefits uh, over field studies, uh, we have constructed a lab scale model provide, uh, which provides actually a better knowledge uh, of groundwater flow and solute transport. We chose to build a 2D, 2D 
box that houses an artificially uh, fractured limestone rock, uh, creating a network of fractures. Uh, they are, there are uh, 77 uh, opening fractures throughout the system, which in, with an average size of 3.7 millimeters in a log normal distribution among all fractures. In order to adequately assess the visual information, meaning photography provided by the pilot, he is enclosed in a black cage that blocks any stray light and so minimizes reflection and the glass. There are two lightings on this system. Uh, there's UV light and normal light. Uh, studies in this pilot have started uh, with experiences of visualization of contaminant plume dissolution. Uh, we have used some fluorescent dyes with very high partition coefficients to dope our contaminant for it, gen for it to gently release the dye when in contact with water. Several studies have confirmed that that P, the pH influence in partition coefficient determination. Furthermore, if we analyze, if we analyze the molecular uh, composition of fluorescent dyes, we can understand that if we neutralize the molecule, uh, we can find a good way to reduce their affinity for water and therefore be more soluble in our contaminant. We therefore have drastically changed the pH in the biphasic system to maximize fluorescent dye dissolution into our contaminant. And then we have a drop it in water uh, and we successfully simulate a color plume once we do that. So the results of these experiments in the back is that after positioning the pollutant over an entire vertical range, as we see in the, in the, in the figure of the, of the right, uh, a lateral flow uh, from right to left was simulated. Uh, it can be seen that in the absence of pollution, so the figure in the left, um, the flow is pr primarily lateral. Uh, primarily lateral, and the addition of the contaminant, on the other hand, changes the flow uh, directions in the tank due to the abundance of the heavy products lodged in the fracture. A densification effect on the water in the plume in the plume is observed. Um, after passing through or touching the napal droplets, uh, the incoming fluid increases its density locally. Uh, the density of this product has, uh, has been determined by samples at the exit of the system, and it was 1.05. Although it appears to be a minor importance by respect of the density of the water, it was enough to, to obstruct the water circulation and to move uh, and, and to change the directions of the flow in the system. Uh, then we perform a water flow artificial tracing test uh, to understand the efficacy, the efficiency of tracer sweep. Um, this test uh, means injecting a saline colored pools equal to 1% of the total fracture volume in my tank. And after the electrical conductivity and visual signal of the pulse injection are recovered and used to analyze the experience. The outcomes will be influenced by the network's geometry. The visual result is very comparable to the break to curve. Um, a very, a very, a first peak corresponding to an eight percent visible of the saline tracer is evidenced uh, the, for the first hand. Later, a second peak comparable to the 88% of the saline tracer recovery corresponds to a nearly successful dispersion of the poles across around among the fractures. Uh, finally, we arrive uh, to a long tail that corresponds to, uh, to the non-recoverable taste tracers that are, still, that are still stuck in the tank's dead zones which is as big as 30% of the injected pulse. This is clear evidence of preferential bats, fingering, and dead zones, which allow us to think that pit experience wouldn't be applicable under these conditions. 
Um, the key challenge is uh, to deliver these tracers uniformly in time and in location. A maximum volume sweeping and recovering of tracers balls injected are the hallmarks of a strong heat uh, breakthrough work. And um, we have analyzed immiscible displacements uh, to, to enhance this uh, sweepness. So in an invisible displacement, uh, we have to understand that increasing the mobility factor or, or viscosity radio avoids, avoids viscous, viscous fingering and aids the entry fluid in press, uh, to present a, flan, a flat front propagation. Therefore, uh, we propose uh, the PIT to be performed with medium to high viscosity fluids as an agent of homogeneous propagation, despite the anisotropy uh, of the medium. Uh, to use high, uh, highly um, dense, highly viscous uh, composites, uh, we have rose tantan. Tantan is a polysaccharide that is an effective thickening agent. And in this experiment, water and tantan were injected to see how quantitatively effective they were in delivering tracers. The actual sweep area was compared to the optimal uh, front. The actual uh, sweep area is in yellow and the, in the from advanced in optimal is in, the, in green. The, they have been analyzed by the base, by the base of the of photos of analysis, imaging analysis. And they were compared between water and xanthan and xanthan solution of 0.2%. The results show that using the gum improves sweep efficiently, efficiency significantly, almost a double. In fact, xanthan values uh, approach one, which is the ideal sweep. And we have a better response into the, into the media. Furthermore, in order to evaluate the influence of sanctum partitioning distribution as a limit to the partitioning, uh, we have in both phases investigated the kinetics of uh, fluorescent dye partitioning. We exposed our contaminant to both aqueous phases, water and sanctum solutions, and watch as the fluorescent dye concentration in the aqueous phases decreased. A scatter has a first order kinetics. Uh, but most important feature in this um, is that the, according to the fit equation, uh, partition grade coefficients do not differ significantly. As a result, the partitioning of the tracers will be unaffected by the use of the sanctum solution as a delivery agent, which is a very good uh, solution. With these encouraging results, we have performed our first fit experiments in our pilot. Our fracture network previously full with water was saturated with pineapple at 1.2% of its fracture volume. Then the pit was performed. Uh, at least 10% of fracture volume was injected in a pulse. Pulse contained sodium chloride as a, as a conservative tracer and rhodamine WT as a partitioning tracer. Both were embedded in a Santan solution of 0.15%. And a ground water velocity of 10 meters per day were, was emulated, and electrical conductivity measurements, as well as samples, were taken periodically. Here are the first results of the test. In the left, the, breakout, the breakthrough curve. Average analyze of this, uh, this curve, um, so a retardation factor of 1.2, a DNAPO saturation of 2%, and a recovery rate of 166%. Uh, it is important, though, to analyze the DNAPO saturation curve as a function of a fracture volume delicately, that it is the picture that we see in the, in the right. Uh, knowing the nature of the geometry and location of the pollutant, it starts with an overestimation due to contact with contaminated zone. Overestimation. Hence, as we advance in time, 
the tracers will sweep more globally and efficiently all the fractures uh, in the system and the results are no longer punctual but global and we can see that at the end we are approaching the true saturation of the DNA pool inside 1.2 percent further studies are in process to analyze which is the, the impact size of uh, santan uh, with respect of water or um, with respect of the concentration or the saturation of the pollutant inside the inside the inside the tank uh, for the conclusions a linear partition coefficient relationships were revealed uh, for fluorescent diet in biphasic media meaning a partition coefficient independent of the concentration of the tracer uh, very good results for fluorescent dyes as partitioning tracers uh, the chlorinated pollutants dissolution plus in fractal media shows contrast the circulation pathways which in which uh, tell us that it's very important to uh, sweep every part of of the fractures and on, not only the flow that follows the water and the preferential paths a uh, fracture volume sweeping in the ball in the pilots is increased by a factor of two when a viscous solution is injected, obviously under certain conditions. The addition of Santa has no effects on kinetics of partition. Uh, the enable characterization of fracture media was enhanced by the increase of viscosity in the propagation agent, but these uh, studies will be confirmed with further studies that we are trying, we are evaluating right now. And the Naples mobilization was not observed during the pit experiment. That is a very good uh, thing because we cannot modify uh, with characterization the, 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 um, the initial uh, conditions of the aquifer. And uh, we saw a, a slight overestimation of the Naples saturation, uh, but uh, we need further studies. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sophia, for another nice presentation. And um, my colleague P Piotr will present the next um, two presentations. Over to you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, so we still have two presentations uh, to go. And the next speaker will be uh, Julien Mata. Uh, Julien is an uh, environmental geologist working in Arcadis of, uh, in France. And um, he manages the site remediation uh, from investigations plans uh, till their remediation, passing through, of course, uh, monitoring programs. Um, and uh, he's also involved in industrial sites uh, deconstruct, uh, deconstruction and uh, connected to the um, network of, uh, of the company. The title of the presentation is Evaluation of Five Years Operations uh, of a Funeral. Uh, and uh, zero valent iron uh, gate system for containment of uh, volatile organic compound and chromium contamination. So please, uh, Julien, the floor is yours. Hello, Peter. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Don't be, be surprised if I present myself twice because this is a, a video. Mm, there is no sound for the time being. Uh, Julien, I don't hear the sound of the video. I don't know if other people can hear it or not. I have some feedback no from sound. the- sound, we cannot hear. Mm -hmm. There's no sound. Uh, so Julien, if you can uh, double check. Sorry, Pichor, I, I do not hear you. Do you hear me? Uh, I can hear you I... now when you speak. Do you hear me? Hello, Julien. Maybe uh, you have some oh, sorry. troubles with uh, the audio um, settings. Do you hear me? Uh, 
Sorry, Pierre. Do, do you hear me? I can hear you, but uh, I, I'm not sure you hear me. Now, now I hear you. Sorry. Okay. So let me share you my screen with yours again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Back to the print. Is that better? Mm, I don't see. No, ah, it's, coming. It's, coming. it's coming for the no? containment of a Vox and Chromium 6 contamination. And we can hear the sound. Here is the agenda of this presentation. I will start by presenting you the context. The action takes place on an automotive plant active since 1968 with existing former chromium plating lines and past solvent uses at the origin of a chromium 6 and Vox contamination. The source area is located below the older production hall with no direct access possible to it. Offside, the contamination spread out from the boundaries below a residential area. We had a strong pressure from the local authorities during the implementation of that remediation. This slide summarizes the site remediation timeframe. Let me present you the conceptual site model. Left hand, you do have the drawing of the older production hall with the location of the main source area corresponding to the chromium plating line. You also have the location of the slurry wall we've implemented with the three filtration gates associated, north, central, and south one. Right hand, you do have a profile of the site that provides you a good idea of the geological and hydrogeological context. Below that profile, you do have the, prof the, the footprint of the contamination from the site till off-site, and a picture of the groundwater flow model constructed during the design phase. The design phase was based on first, a strong geological characterization along the proposed alignment for, for the slurry wall. Secondly, the construction of a groundwater flow model that provided us the best positioning for the three filtration gates. Thirdly, lab testing to evaluate the best formation for, to implement the slurry wall. Andly, lab testing to evaluate the best ZVI to be used for that remediation. In the end, in the end the wall in, the, installed was approximately 220 meters long and it was incurred at around 10 meter depth. Three filtration gates have been uh, installed along that structure. Once in place, in place, we've engaged a performance monitoring. It was based on two main topics, hydro performance and chemistry performance. Talking about hydro performance, uh, we focused on the slurry wall uh, uh, and, and the gate. The existing and notable differences between piezometric level upgrade and downgrade inside of the wall, at least half a meter, provided us the confirmation of the efficiency of the slurry wall. Regarding the gates, we clearly identify a direct influence of the precipitation on this system. We also identify possible deactivation pe periods uh, on certain gates, and this is this this is the case of the north gate, which is illustrated right hand on the hydrograph you do have. Then, from one gate to another, behavior could can be and are different due to local uh, geological and hydrogeological uh, specificity. From a global point of view, uh, the system had a clear influence on the hydrogeology, with uh, this has clearly been identified on the groundwater table maps. Talking about the chemistry now, uh, the graph you do have here presents you the evolution of the abatement rate from the beginning of uh, the installation of this, uh, from the installation of the system till nowadays. You can notice that after two years of operation, we've identified the first sign of loss of efficiency. Based on that observation, we've implemented a series of actions to understand and try to counter that phenomenon. First type of action we implemented to understand 
this passivation phenomenon was a tracer test implemented at Central and Northgate. Back to the design phase, uh, the ZVI effective porosity was supposed to be 50, uh, 45%. Considering a, a loss of uh, porosity of 3% per year in the, in the design phase, that would mean that after three and a half year of operation, uh, corresponding to 2017, the moment we've implemented the tracetus, we should have been at around 35, 34% of remaining effective porosity. Thanks to the tracer tests performed in 2017, uh, it led us to the following figures. 1% at Northern Gate, 16% at Central Gate. These findings uh, provide us, uh, led us to, to identify uh, the existence of a significant clogging phenomenon and uh, identify that the flow rates that could remain generally high, uh, in particular at uh, the northern gate with half a meter per day, uh, could be linked and is cert was certainly linked to the existence of the opening of preferential pathway in the clogged material. Second type of action we've, we've conducted took place during the first OLM action in July 2019, conducted uh, at Northern Gate. We took two samples of used CVI in the two cartridges of the filtration gates. We've put it in contact with contaminated water coming from the site, uh, see first picture, picture, and we have let it uh, in contact during three days. After three days, no uh, remaining contamination was identified in the, in, the, in the water. This is illustrated in the third picture, but also in the graph you do have right hand. Ba based on that, it was clear that the ZVI extracted from the system was still active, and the loss of efficiency uh, identified in the curves, uh, uh, in the abutment curves I've just presented you, was not so evident. Starting that moment, we've talked about apparent passivation. Last type of action we've, we've conducted was uh, tests with a laboratory, the laboratory of UD La Salle University. The objective here was to understand the clogging phenomenon by first identifying the nature of the precipitate uh, present in the, in the clogged material in the ZVI. Secondly, identify possible natural components that may interact, uh, interact and or come from the contamination in the groundwater. Thirdly, evaluate the existence and the importance of the preferential path flow phenomenon. For that, we used different type of methods uh, <clears throat> from the X-ray diffraction analysis, passing through optical microscopy till scanning electron microscopy. Regarding precipitated phases that we've identified. First, iron precipitated were clearly identified with the formation of oxide, magnetite and hematite, and hydroxide, getite. Calcite has also been identified at the inlets and the outlets of the system, but also at the top of the cartridges. This was clearly linked to the geochemistry uh, context, upgrade inside and downgrade inside of the system, but also uh, certainly linked with ex due, due to exchange with the atmosphere at the top of the, of the cartridges that could have been in contact with oxygen. We've also identified a chlorinated organic phase that could correspond to a new mineral, but this remains a question at this stage. In the end, a portion of residual ZVI regent is still very abundant in the system. However, it is systematically covered with an alteration layer that can then tend to decrease or even inhibit its remaining reactive uh, potential. Talking about natural components and or components coming from the contamination, the analytical methods indicated that the presence of dissolved carbon 
uh, dissolved ca calcium carbonate in the water that could explain the formation of uh, calcite, of chlorinated organic compounds, clearly linked to the presence of Vox uh, contamination, but also oxygen, uh, for sure at the origin of the formation of oxide and hydroxide. We've also identified aluminium, uh, certainly due to the initial composition of the ZVI. Chromium has not been detected as pure phase, uh, but it is for sure fixed by the ZVA looking at the abutment curves I've presented you. The substance of this detection is certainly due to the substitution of iron 3 by chroma 3 in the magnetite oxide. The crystallization system we're talking about here is named spinal. Last type of uh, testing we've conducted uh, used the, the uh, electronic microscopy. The objective here was to evaluate uh, the, prefer the preferential path flow phenomenon. For that, uh, for what that test has been conducted on hard sample uh, only, where the porosity was generally reduced, and the permeability as well, uh, due to uh, the, 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 the presence of crystallized bridges uh, formed between the ZVI grains. This is what is illustrated right hand. As a reminder, the design porosity, uh, the design was considering a porosity of 45%. Here, uh, the loss of porosity has been um, evaluated at 10% using, using that technique, meaning the, remain, remain, the, meaning the remaining global porosity is around 35%. Uh, So after seven years of operation and one OM event, here are some lessons learned we can share with you. First, the Falangi system as a passive system presents a high sensitivity to its environmental, to its environment, weather, geology, hydrogeology, geochemistry. As a consequence, and for a good understanding of the system in such a complex geological context, it's important to develop a deep an adaptive performance monitoring program along the time. The more data you will collect, the better you will understand your system. And for that, you can use data management tools. In the present case, the occurrence of precipitation leading to the clogging of the ZVI, essentially due to hydroxide formation, with, a consequence, with the consequence of an apparent passivation of the reactive, could be countered by the injection of an organic compound or nitrate-free water flushing. But this is something we have to assess. Mineralogic approach is a good tool to be considered. In our case, uh, it provided us a better understanding of the clogging phenomenon. Finally, it's important to consider a certain flexibility on the system during the design phase to allow adaptation during the ONM phase, which will depend on what observation you will realize during the monitoring phase, but also the ONM phase itself. Thank you for your attention. Hello, thank you uh, for the video presentation. I think we can go um, to the next uh, speaker. Uh, um, she's Michelle uh, Creamy. Uh, Michelle is the Dean of the Graduate School and Professor uh, of Civil Engin Engineering at uh, Clarkson University. And um, she has been developing uh, and evaluating technologies um, and approaches for uh, treatment of contaminated groundwater. Uh, she also represents uh, the uh, US Department uh, of defense uh, different research programs. Uh, so uh, Michelle uh, will present today to us uh, the remediation of chlorinated and fluorinated organic contaminants. So Michelle, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, 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 we can hear you and we see the presentation full screen. Wonderful. So it's an honor to be here today representing the US Department of Defense's Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program an Environmental Security Technology Certification Program, or CERTIP and ESTCP. 
Today, I'll be talking about some of the lessons learned from nearly 30 years of DOD investment in treating chlorinated contaminants in groundwater and how those lessons learned are applying to the way that we're now addressing more challenging fluorinated compounds. There we go. So here you see a timeline of fundamental research and development efforts funded by CERTA that have focused on managing chlorinated solvent sites. Early work in the 90s and early 2000s focused heavily on developing and advancing specific technologies and approaches for treating chlorinated solvents. But over time, you see greater acknowledgement and strategic investment in addressing complex sites, in site characterization for improved and more efficient treatment, and in developing decision support guidance for practitioners. In dealing with more challenging fluorinated compounds, we want to remember to consider site complexities site characterization and decision support tools alongside of developing new technologies for managing PFAS contaminated sites. And this will enable us to expedite practical management solutions more readily. Since about 2011 or so, CERTIP and ESTCP have been directing research and demonstrations for managing PFAS contamination. And an interesting trend that you see here is early recognition of the value of robust site characterization including how sites are sampled and how PFAS are analyzed. There's also a significant effort to control sources of contamination with a focus on developing fluorine-free substitutes for AFFF. And in, in, in diving deeper into these project descriptions, uh, you would also see that many also capture development of decision support guidance right alongside of developing new tools for characterizing and treating sites. To learn more about the development and advancement of approaches for treating chlorinated solvent sites, I recommend this report by Tom Sale and colleagues that captures some frequently asked questions. I just wanna point out a couple of quick things. First, the figure on the left points to key paradigm shifts that have occurred over decades of lessons learned in site remediation. And I like this final statement that the authors make in the figure. The best news about being better informed is that we can now avoid the mistakes of the past. And with the daunting challenges presented by PFAS contamination, these paradigm shifts give a sense of optimism that we can move faster with these fluorinated compounds. In the figure on the right, you see the shift in focus of remediations, of remediation efforts over time for chlorinated solid sites, how the efforts of the earlier stages drove greater understanding of the full scale of the challenges over time. And I would argue that while we're still learning a lot about PFAS contamination and the full scale of the problem, we are tuned in to the fact that we need to look for some of these focus areas in parallel rather than serially. And there's another factor that makes me optimistic about our ability to develop solutions for PFAS. This is a great study published by Chuck Newell and colleagues that gives an indicator of the relative level of effort to clean up PFAS contamination relative to chlorinated solvents and other key contaminants. They use databases of site contamination characteristics to estimate the median concentrations of these contaminants across sites and the orders of magnitude and reduction of those contaminant concentrations to reach regulatory or guidance level concentrations. Overall, we're looking at one to two orders of magnitude of reduction necessary for PFAS sites while we're looking at two to four orders of magnitude and reduction necessary for TCE sites. So once we do have a robust suite of technical approaches to address PFAS, perhaps they will ultimately be less challenging to manage than TCE has been across the board. So with the remainder of my time today, I'm gonna to highlight a few projects funded by CERTIP and ESTCP to manage chlorinated solvent sites that have given us some key lessons to adopt in developing PFAS treatment approaches and along with a, a couple of quick examples of such approaches. Now to make my life a little bit easier, I conveniently focused on projects that I've been directly involved in with a nod here on this slide to my collaborating partners. But I do really wanna point out that these are just a couple of quick examples of a large portfolio of CERTIP and ESTCB projects that a broad array of both academic and practitioner researchers rely on as a base going forward. So the first project I'll touch on is the use of polymers for improved delivery of chemical oxidants. The goal in this project was to demonstrate the use of xanthan gum 
to improve chemical accident delivery. Never would I have guessed that this would be the third presentation today to reference xanthan gum. Xanthan offers a viscosity differential that promotes movement of solution into layers of lower permeability. So the value of adding xanthan is shown here in this lab study. This shows you the delivery of dissolved red dye to a stratified media spanning three orders of magnitude and hydraulic conductivity. You see the dye pass primarily through the highest permeability layer, even after two full pore volumes of throughput. Now on the right-hand side, 800 milligrams um, per liter of xanthan gum was added to the dye solution. And you can see the remarkable difference in the movement of the dye through the layers of media. This approach was demonstrated in an ESTCP funded project at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. At the site, which had a heavy contamination by PCE from former dry cleaning operations, we set up two plots. A test plot where permanganate, xanthan gum uh, were delivered, and a control plot where only permanganate was delivered. So injection occurred at the center of each plot, and after delivery, soil cores were taken across both plots in three transects each, A, B, and C. Now, because of the purple color of permanganate and the brown color of the permanganate byproduct, we could readily log the presence and absence of oxidant for each of the soil cores, which was then confirmed by chemical analyses. And these were then mapped with distance from injection, marked IW4 in the control plot and IW3 in the test plot along each radius away from injection from the, uh, in, in the transects. So these are just one example of these map, maps for each plot, these transects. And you can see in the control plot that the oxidant passed through very specific depths within the media with little measurable oxidant further away from injection. As expected, the oxidant passed only through the most permeable layers, but results for the test plot containing polymer on the right-hand side show much more uniform delivery. Only the least permeable layers didn't see oxidant. So results were then extrapolated to create these 3D plots to estimate the percentage of the treatment plot contacted by oxidant for the sweep efficiency. For the control plot, only 33% of the volume was estimated to be contacted by oxidant, while in the test plot, we saw double the sweep efficiency, or about 67%. So in short, a straightforward addition of inexpensive polymer to our amendment solution had a very strong influence on our ability to treat the contaminated soil and groundwater. And key lessons to carry forward from this project are that site characterization is critical to the success of treatment and that coupling approaches, here viscosity modification with chemical oxidation can facilitate treatment of recalcitrant compounds. Our second case study, the horizontal reactive media treatment well, or the HRX well. The HRX well developed and patented by Arcadis is a large diameter well oriented horizontally in the subsurface in the direction of groundwater flow. The well is filled with reactive media that will actually treat contaminants as the water passes through it. It's particularly appealing because the technology is completely passive. Water follows the path of least resistance through the well, requiring no pumping at all. <clears throat> flow is focused into the well, so uh, a well can capture across a treatment area many times the diameter of the well. There's a wide range of media types can be used, thus it's applicable to a wide range of contaminants. And the well actually works better in lower permeability than in higher, which is uncommon for in-situ groundwater treatment. Finally, the approach requires minimal maintenance, so long-term costs are low. So after some lab and pilot scale testing, a full-scale demonstration at Vandenberg Air Force Base was led by Arcadis, where concentrations of TCE were measured up to 40 milligrams per liter in the water. Zero valent iron or ZVI was used inside of the well to destroy the TCE. So based on preliminary models ahead of the demonstration, we expected about 17 meters of water capture width by the 30 centimeter diameter well. You can see the thin well at the midline of the picture here with the estimated capture in red. This and other models and model components were used in this project to develop a robust design tool. 
In the tool, practitioners can input their site characteristics and walk through the tool's decision criteria to develop a full-scale design for implementation. At Vandenberg, the well drilled was about 168 meters long to a depth of about six meters. And based on uh, more detailed design modeling, we were targeting a capture width of about 12 to 15 meters. And based on the flow characteristics at the site, the water was estimated to spend between six and 20 days in contact with the ZBI. And here you see that the well did indeed focus flow into the well with quite a flat gradient before the well was installed shown on the left and a 40 times greater gradient into the well after installation shown on the right. Importantly, these measurements matched our tool predictions quite well. In short, the HRX well decreased concentrations of TCE by more than 99% as water flowed across the zero valent iron measured right at the well exit. And uh, you, can, you can see the extended impact further down gradient uh, away from the well too. And the key lessons to carry forward from this demonstration you see listed here, treatment approaches that rely on mass flux reduction like the HRX well can enable practical and cost-effective treatment. Enabling technologies such as horizontal wells can facilitate treatment as a means of deploying standard approaches like reductive dechlorination using DVI. Finally, when design tools are developed and validated during field step demonstration, these can go a long way toward facilitating technology transfer and adoption. So moving on to a couple of PFAS focused projects with a quick acknowledgement to my collaborating product, uh, partners shown here. When we started looking at approaches to treat these more challenging fluorinated compounds, we really had to acknowledge early on that while we can carry key lessons forward, there's also some important differences between fluorinated solvent sites and PFAS sites. First, PFAS are simply more recalcitrant. So we need new ways that we can deploy aggressive physical chemical treatment processes that are different than those that we use to treat fluorinated solvents. And because we need more aggressive treatment approaches, this translates to potentially higher cost. Thus, we have an even greater need to consider coupling approaches or combined remedies that'll allow for improved efficiency. And because PFAS are found pretty much everywhere at low concentrations, and because our target treatment goals are extremely low, the need to understand site conditions and to consider mass flux reduction approaches are even more critical. So with these key differences in mind, we set out to develop a reactor that enables destruction of PFAS in situ using synolysis deployed within an HRX well. With the HRX well as an inspiration, we designed the in-situ reactor to be, to be deployed in a horizontal well, and we've dubbed this reactor insert. Water is captured by the well, flows into the reactor where treatment occurs, and clean water exits. The insert reactor uses ultrasound waves which cause cavitation, or the formation of what look like bubbles, but they're actually cavities in liquid. Because of their surface active nature, many PFAS compounds line up on the surface of these cavities at the interface. Like bubbles, cavities grow, and when they reach a certain size, they collapse, releasing localized high heat and pressure. This can directly pyrolyze PFAS and also form reactive free radical species like aqueous electrons, which can degrade long and short chain compounds and PFAS precursors. So here we take strategic advantage of the localized high energy resulting from cavitation to destroy PFAS. And by deploying ultrasound in situ, we eliminate expensive pumping by taking advantage of passive capture offered by the horizontal well. We've tested the reactor using field site contaminated groundwater. These field samples include a broad array of different PFAS compounds, but here I focus on PFOA and PFOS results. So each field site is represented by a different color. Results for PFOA are shown by the left-hand bar and results for PFOS are the right-hand bar. The number above the bar shows the applied treatment time in minutes and these vary because some of these were early range finding studies. And the results tell us that while treatment effectiveness varies as a function of site conditions, greater than 90% treatment is achievable given long enough treatment time. By coupling horizontal wells with an aggressive destructive treatment approach, 
we now have a design that can reduce PFAS mass flux at a site with efficiencies gained by not having to pump water out for ex situ treatment. We adapted the HRX well design tool to include sonolytic destructive treatment parameters, and we're now nearly ready for an upcoming field demonstration at Peterson Air Force Base here in the US. And the final project that I'll highlight just very briefly is a treatment train that couples in situ and ex situ approaches for efficient treatment of PFAS impacted groundwater. The combined remedy involves first oxidizing PFAS precursors in situ, intentionally using persulfate and oxygen. By intentionally oxidizing precursors using persulfate or oxygen, we can accelerate that transformation process and ideally eliminate long-term sources of compounds of concern and ultimately abbreviate our treatment time. And this also creates a more uniform and manageable stream entering the next step of the treatment train, the ion exchange pump and treat system. So the oxidized groundwater with transformed precursors enters the ion exchange system. We're working with a regenerable resin and investigating different approaches for regeneration in terms of cost effectiveness, ease of implementation and health and safety. Not only do we want to reuse the resin, we also want to reuse the regenerate solution. So we're also investigating different approaches to separate PFAS from the regenerate stream. By concentrating PFAS on the resin, then further concentrating them in the regenerate separation process, we're left with a small volume of high concentration PFAS waste, which can then be efficiently destroyed using a plasma treatment system. So this is a near complete project. Uh, we've had good success and advancing each step of the train. And currently our team is developing conceptual designs for implementing the approach at example sites, along with cost estimates and assessing implementation challenges. The ex situ components of the treatment train have been successfully field demonstrated at Pease Air Force Base in the US and, and that project report is nearly wrapped up and will be publicly available soon. So in summary, our lessons learned from years of developing approaches for treating chlorinated solvents are helping us to advance remedies for PFAS contamination. And I believe that we'll see accelerated development of technologies and approaches when we remember and adopt these key lessons in our path forward. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michelle. Mm, uh, give the floor now to uh, the E. Um, hi, um, everyone. Um, I, I think it's the one we um, we are already um, over the the, the, the original um, schedule time um, by about five minutes. Um, I mean, I, I would encourage our participants to um, to email questions to our speakers, um, and we can probably quickly go through um, maybe one question for each speaker. So we can have like seven questions. Um, I will first ask um, our first two speakers um, a quick question that I connected from the chat room. For um, I have uh, one question was asked, if the gel displaced the groundwater and uh, was still it present one month later, um, could you give a quick answer? Yes, I actually answered this in direct messages, but I will answer it publicly. So I said that that the what what uh, Guy says said is correct, and actually during the the first injection of gels, we could sample water through the monitoring wells, but after injecting the whole volumes, only gel came out from uh, through the monitoring wells actually, and we considered that the 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 the, the the collected samples actually were for uh, groundwater samples. Okay, thank you, Ahab. Uh, next, I will ask Craig a quick question. What is the remedial strategy for groundwater contaminated with mixed contaminants? Well, uh, can you repeat the question? What is the remedial strategy for groundwater contaminated by a mixture of contaminants? Okay, the, the strategies that we used, uh, most of our uh, contaminants were all, uh, you know, the chlorinated solvents. Um, the reason we used different technologies was because one, uh, different clients wanted to try different things. So some people had the money for in-situ thermal, 
Uh, for other uh, companies, the goal was to uh, clean up the Vado zone. So that's why we used air sparge and soil vapor extraction. And then eventually more of these technologies just became available. So we went from um, potassium permanganate to eventually EZVI uh, when it became available. So it's basically a decisions made by uh, the finances for the and goals for each situation and what's becoming available as we move forward through the evolution of these uh, systems. Okay, thank you, Craig. Now I hand it to David. Thanks, Dai. Um, I have also one question each. I think Christoph already answered one of the question in the chat box. Uh, but my question is, um, how do you inject the uh, sodium sulfate and uh, iron sulfate? Are they mixed or in series, one after the other? Is Christoph around here? Uh, all right, okay, for time's sake, I'll move on to uh, one of the questions for Marta. Um, so the question was, uh, the biochars have no impact Yes, but the heat treatment in the preparation process may have some effect. Do you think the volcanic stuff or zeliotic soil can be combined with it? Oh, uh, maybe it's in the box of the... Okay. Yes. Maybe I've read maybe. it, okay. Um, yeah. yeah, the preparation uh, surely have an impact on the morphological characteristics of the biochar. Uh, we have chosen the one prepared with the higher temperature because it was the one closer to the activated uh, carbon. So we tested before a commercial one and uh, for the absorption mechanism, it was the best uh, performances uh, was uh, the pine wood biochar, uh, especially for the uh, micro porosity and uh, also for the graphite-like structure. So I cannot answer to the question about the zeolite because uh, I've never worked with them. So uh, the only thing I can say uh, is that uh, we have also an influence on the pH of the solution. The solution. So we have to uh, have a look always on this when we work with Baishar. So maybe with also with Zulite and other, other things. Thanks, Martha. I'll move on Thank to you. Sophie quickly. Um, a very brief answer for Sophie. Um, so the question is, can, can fluorescent dyes measured using in-situ fluorometers placed in different wells to be used for more detailed site characterization? Or is this methodology not often used Hence, may not be um, useful in this context. Uh, is Sophie around? Yes, I am here. Uh, yes. Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Well, indeed, fluorescent dyes are largely used in the characterization of fracture aquifers geometry already, uh, mm -hmm. but they are not used as partition in tracers yet. Uh, the mm -hmm. question she says is that uh, you, uh, the partition in inter interwell tracer test is a uh, is an interwell. Uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of wells that can interact in, in this uh, in this characterization. It could mm -hmm. be useful, uh, yes, to use fluorescent dyes. It could be useful, yes. It can, it wasn't been tested yet, but that is why I'm doing this research research to later apply it in. In other place, in other Thanks, thanks, Sophia. And over to you, Pia. Uh, yes, uh, I, I have a question for uh, Julien. Uh, what is the effect of the gate clogging on the overall groundwater plume migration? Uh, so, Julien, if you're with us. Yes, I'm here. Uh, yeah, the effect uh, on the site is good. Uh, if we consider it stops clearly the, the, the contamination coming from the site and the source area. Uh, located uh, upgrade and site. Uh, but then talking about the plume downgrade and site, uh, if we consider the mass of pollutant that was already in place there, uh, it, it is necessary to have some actions on it, uh, like uh, like system of injection or, or things like that to, to remediate uh, that, uh, that area as well. 
Okay, thank you very much for these additional hints. And uh, the, the last question I'm rushing to uh, Michelle um, from the public. Um, somebody was wondering uh, how and what do we consider before choosing a particular remediation destruction technique between uh, um, sonolysis or uh, plasma, for example, in case of PFAS? Yeah, that's a really great question. I did pop a quick response uh, into the chat um, because I thought we might run out of time. Um, but you know, really the, the key way to make the decision is to, to develop some conceptual designs of how the technology could be implemented, do some treatability testing and use those results to determine the cost because ultimately, you know, the cost is gonna be the key consideration. There's certainly site specific factors, but those should be captured when you're working towards that conceptual design. So okay, that's the thanks. short answer. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, of thank course, you. everybody can contact uh, the speakers to have more details. Thank you very much, Michelle. Okay. Um, I, thank you all very much. I think it's coming to the end of our session. Um, I, I think all the, um, the, the, the speakers are, will welcome the participants to um, send the questions through email. Um, please feel free to do so. Um, and uh, once again, thank you very much for participating in this session. Thank you all.